ready for takeoff. Let's get started. This old app. Um, my name is Lori Olson. Uh, you can find me on social media uh, just about anywhere with the tag Windex Lori or WNDX Lori. I'm from Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Uh, my husband Trevor is down in the audience and I am a dog mom of two cute little dogs, Scooter and Casey. I also am a developer, trainer, and mentor of over 35 years, and more recently, the founder of the Windex School of Mobile Apps, where I teach about Ruby Motion and Dragon Ruby. And I'm the creator of Six Pack Apps, my program where I teach people how to go from app idea to successfully launched app. So, warning, um, this is stories from my 35 year career and Ruby didn't exist 35 years ago, so there will be some non-Ruby content. So this old house, or wait, no, no, we were going to do this old app. Um, well, actually, this is the question that I was exploring. Old houses and old apps. We started a house renovation this year, and it occurred to me that old houses and old apps actually have quite a lot in common. So when you're talking about upgrading an app or renovating a house, there are so many commonalities. So we'll start at the beginning. This is our house. Um, it's a four level split. It was built in 1955. Uh, we purchased it in 2014 from the original owners. So they'd owned it for 59 years. And as you can imagine, it needed quite a few updates. Now, when you talk about house renovations or app upgrades, they kind of actually follow the same sort of pattern where you need to do a lot of planning, um, you need to schedule what's gonna happen, and then there's demolition or you know ripping shit out of your app, uh, construction, building all the fun new stuff into your app, and then of course, there's all the finishing details. But what makes the journey really interesting is all the challenges that you face along the way. So let's start talking about some of those challenges. So our ceiling. Now ceilings are fun, especially when you have things like skylights. And we have three of them in our house. And we've had some fun experiences with leaks. And in fact, there was a whole lot of scary shit up in that ceiling when we decided we were gonna take it down. One of the first things we learned was that this roof of ours was stick built and not truss built. So if you're unfamiliar with roof framing, truss built is like engineered, it's structured, they build these trusses off site and bring them in and they're all very even and you know straightforward. Stick built though, that's all built on site, custom, on the fly, and it's very sort of higgledy piggledy which really explains some of the weird shit around our skylights. And then wasps. And you're like, okay, what does wasps have to do with ceilings? Wow. So one day we came home and in this window right here, we found like 50 wasps. And that was rather terrifying, especially since we have two small dogs. So we hired an exterminator and he came and crawled around on the roof and he was like, I don't know, there's this hole over here, maybe that's where they're getting in. And he injected some insecticide and we cleared up the wasps inside and 
Now we only get an occasional wasp coming in who's very slow and probably crawled through the insecticide. Okay, but when we took down the ceiling, they found four wasp nests up in the ceiling. And yeah, they weren't happy and neither were we. So of course, I'm sure you can't possibly think of an analogy when you're doing app upgrades and finding stuff under the covers when you start ripping things apart. Which reminds me of my gas pack project. This is very early in my career. Uh, gas pack stands for gas plant product accounting. Yes, I worked in the oil patch for quite a number of years. And when we were doing our upgrade slash rewrite, we started experiencing a lot of random crashes in gas pack. Now, this is a code smell, and it is often the smell of a memory stomp in your application. So yes, I ended up having to go on a bug hunt. And I'm sure some of you who are familiar with uh, old C applications, which is what this was, um, thinks, oh, well, there's, there's like tools for that. But this was cutting edge when I did this app. Borland C++ and Object Windows Library. And no, there were not cool tools for hunting memory stones. So let me just jump to the end of the story momentarily and say what we actually had was an off by one error. In the combo box control of the Object Windows Library, when you said, hey, I'm gonna put a string in here that is eight characters long, they only allocated eight characters, which if you're familiar with C again, is wrong. You need nine characters because you need space for that null terminator on your string. So how did we actually find this? Well, we ended up debugging assembly code because the memory manager was written in assembly code. And I'm sure you're kind of thinking now, wait, if it was like an off by one error, uh, like why was it hard to find? Why was it random? Why didn't it just happen all the time when you used the con combo box? Well, turns out when you dig into the assembly code of the memory manager that they allocated memory in four byte chunks. So if you were allocating memory for, say, a seven character string, you got eight bytes. And you wouldn't have a memory stomp because there was that extra byte at the end. But I was allocating strings of eight characters exactly in one spot in my app. And so randomly, <laughs> when uh, that was hit, the app would crash. Okay, let's move on to our next challenge. Flooring in our house. So you always have this choice right, when you have hardwood. Are you going to refinish it or replace it? Now obviously, this is beautiful hardwood floor. And it was original and we wanted to save it. In fact, we saved the old stuff from a previous renovation renovation on the upper floor so that we could piece in um, hardwood to replace the kitchen linoleum. And our general contractor uh, started hiring a floor contractor and he actually went through four different contractors because they quit and they priced themselves out of the job and they outright refused to even quote on the job. And I had to ask myself, why? Why were these people basically refusing and avoiding this job? So when he brought the fifth contractor in, I was like, I wanna be there. I wanna ask these people questions. What is it? And it turns out that this was a really freaking difficult job because these floors were so old, we had old slat underneath the hardwood and piecing old hardwood in, 
trying to even it up and make it actually a job you can be proud of, that was going to be an excessive amount of labor and would cost an excessive amount of money. So in the end, we actually ended up ripping out that gorgeous old hardwood and replacing it with new. But I think you'll agree, the new stuff looks awesome too. So that reminded me of the NGL Now project that I worked on, the Natural Gas Liquids Inventory System. And these folks had to do an upgrade. They had to do an upgrade for three years, and they failed. And they spent a lot of blood, sweat, and developer tears on this, and they still failed to do their upgrades for three years. And then they hired me, a supposed Java expert. Yep, it was a Java project. And they wanted to go, by this time, three years later, they had to go from WebLogic 5.1 all the way up to WebLogic 8. So this was a fairly significant jump. So I started looking at what could the problems be. Well, the first problem was licensing. Now, having been an experienced WebLogic developer, I knew that WebLogic 5.1 had a cool little bug. It was a cool little bug where you could run a production instance using a developer license for free. Yeah. So yes, actually, that was what they did. They did have an official license. They weren't using it. But when they went to upgrade, they could not upgrade because the licensing was always standing in the way. I figured this out for them. I got them their new license, and we got past this hurdle, which led us into XML hell. There were five or six different XML libraries involved in this project, all of them three plus years out of date. And well, I don't know if you're familiar with XML development back in the early 2000s, but the library developers were deprecation happy and semantic versioning, what's that? Um, they were basically, oh, let's deprecate this API, and in the next point release, let's remove it. And in the next point release, let's remove that, or let's deprecate that thing we just added. And in the next point release, let's remove that. It was a nightmare. And again, the people in our project had difficulties. I, however, knew that this was just really hard work. So I downloaded all the source tarballs, I rebuilt all of the Java docs. I read through everything <clears throat> to find the deprecations and the replacements for the things being deprecated and basically moved each library along one point release at a time until we got to the future. Okay, so that was very difficult, however, we got to the end, we upgraded the app, everybody was happy, and the development team was educated in a process going forward so that they could keep their app upgraded. See, I got one of my dogs in here. So it does pay actually to hire experience when you're having problems. Next challenge, our fireplace. Now, why with this beautiful fireplace that we actually, you know, was a significant reason why we bought this house. Why would this be a problem? Well, we didn't love the bulky, over-engineered extras, like a half wall and a squat, ugly closet made out of brick that was attached to the fireplace. Not only that, but in front of the fireplace was a conversation pit and I use the term loosely because this is what a conversation pit is supposed to look like. This is a mid-century sort of styling and you're supposed to have stairs down and you're supposed to have comfy seating and it's supposed to be kind of spacious. This was not spacious. There was a huge drop down, there were no stairs. 
We just, oh, it was horrible. We didn't like it. And then raccoons. Ha, ah, where did raccoons come in? Yes, we had raccoons living in the chimney. This actually is a real picture of a mama raccoon trapped in the live trap and the two baby raccoons trying to figure out how to get her out. We did eventually trap all of the raccoons and get them relocated out of the city, only to have a new family move in. Okay, so during our uh, renovation, um, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there's like water stains on our brick. And at this stage of the renovation, our contractor leaned up against the fireplace, looked up and said, hey, I can see daylight. And I was like, of course you can see daylight. I've been telling people, this is where the leak is. Yes, that is where the leak was. So we've got that fixed. And we're at an almost done stage here. The fireplace looks actually pretty beautiful. We now have a natural gas insert. The chimney has been capped off, no more raccoons. And of course, we filled in the conversation pit. So this reminded me of the Perfectly Clear project. Perfectly Clear is a photo correction library. And it is actually the photo correction library that you will find in most of these photo printing kiosks out there um, where you plug in your digital photos and they do some sort of magic, which is perfectly clear, that makes your photo better automatically. Um, but the perfectly clear folks actually wanted to have a sort of direct to consumer version. So they wanted to have a Photoshop plugin. And they hired a team, and that team was building a Windows version of the plugin. But they also wanted a version for the Mac. And that team didn't want to do it. So a friend of mine recommended me to do this work. And I'm like, hey, Mark, you know I don't know squat about Mac development, right? And he's like, oh, you're a good developer. I know you can do it, Lori. So, I buckled down, learned some stuff, and of course, this was right when Apple decided they were gonna switch out their carbon API for the new coolness, Cocoa. Of course, Photoshop is written in carbon at this point. And the Photoshop plugin libraries were actually quite grotesque. This is when I also discovered that the Windows guys knew they were grotesque and they were just building the Windows plugin using Windows APIs. This is why they didn't want to do the Mac version. So the Perfectly Clear guys also wanted to have a plugin that would be reusable beyond Photoshop. So thinking I didn't want to leave them saddled with a plugin that was going to be immediately obsolete, I wrote the plugin using Cocoa and wrapped it in the plugin Carbon APIs, which was kind of cool. I, I was proud of that. And then we started running into bugs. So at this point, we had photos that would come in with 8-bit colors and photos that would come in with 16-bit colors. The 8-bit color stuff worked fabulously well. 16-bit, not so much. And when I hit this bug, we had like one week left till the big trade show where they were gonna introduce this plugin. This is also the point where they went, oh yeah, the Windows guys have been struggling with this bug for months. So, but with this knowledge, I was like, okay, well, if it's in Windows and in Mac, this has to be something that Photoshop is doing. So I insisted that they actually pay the money to get into the Photoshop developers community. And we got into the Photoshop private forums where I discovered in an obscure corner in only one place this description. Why does my 16-bit plugin only see values from 0 to 32,768? 15-bit and not 0 to 65,535, 16-bits. 
That's because they only use 15 bits of the data from the colors. They're obviously screwing around, doing something special with that extra bit. OK. So I wrote a filter to translate our 16-bit colors into a 15-bit space. And lo and behold, the plugin actually started to work. Yay. I wrote up a description of what I did for the Windows guys. They fixed their version, and lo and behold, we managed to successfully get the plugin in for the trade show. Yay. Another challenge, books and bookcases. I mean, maybe not everybody has this challenge, but we do. We have lots of books, so many books, lots and lots of bookshelves. Here's where we started to pull them all down during our renovation. And when you're doing this, you need to have a certain amount of order and structure um, to categorize your, your books and number the boxes. And you pack them away in reverse so that when you're unpacking them, you get from the beginning, which is kind of important. We ended up with 55 boxes of books stored in our garage, which is fun. Now, we actually calculated the number of linear shelf feet that we needed for storing all our books, which is important when you're designing an entire new bookcase because we wanted to have enough space and maybe some extra because, yeah, books, they just multiply. So this is the first half of our new bookshelf, and this is the second half of our new bookshelf. And in fact, if you use the wide-angle camera, you can now see the entire eastern wall of our house is one massive bookcase. And we love it. So a little bit of planning, and you too can have beautiful things. This reminded me of my very first Rails project, eTriever. So eTriever was a Rails app from a very early stage, but it did grow to be a behemoth that provided access to all of the oil and gas data in Canada. Well data, production, land, pipelines, facilities, environmental incidents, all of it. Someone else's data, not ours. In someone else's data center, not ours. In Oracle. Yeah, so this was not entirely fun. Also not entirely fun, this data is stored in the PPDM data model, the public petroleum data model. Over 2,600 tables created by hundreds of industry experts, oil industry experts. Yes, that means exactly what you people laughing think it means. It is a hot mess of a data model. And dealing with it is SQL join hell. And accessing data in a remote data center. We had problems. We had access problems. We had authentication problems. We had internet latency problems. We had performance problems. We had we take the database down for updates problems. So eventually, we decided we were going to do an upgrade. But it was actually kind of a rewrite. And we created WellTreeber, just one simple app for one subset of the data, wells. And we created our own database. We used Redis as our primary database. That may sound odd, but it worked out really well. And we populated that database with asynchronous jobs using Sidekick. And these jobs ran daily, weekly, and monthly to update the data that was updated daily, weekly, and monthly from our data source. But we were no longer subject to this remote data center for our application. And all the reports that people wanted to generate Sure, they still had to access that remote data store, 
but we did it all again asynchronously with Sidekick, unlike the previous app where everything was live against the remote database. And we ended up with Welltriever, which was a fantastically performant app that was easy to use, easy to navigate, and we never had to worry about remote access, slow access, or the database is down. Again, yay. Next challenge, the walls. Okay, walls are important in your house. And one of the decisions you have to make when you are renovating is, are you gonna paint over all this old drywall or are you gonna rip it down and replace it? Well, we were also taking down walls with our renovation. And when you take down walls, you end up having to do a lot of patching. So guess what? 60 year old drywall and new drywall have different thicknesses. So we discovered this when we did a renovation on our upstairs four years ago. And we were doing the patching route and our drywallers hated us and so did the painters because everything was uneven and didn't look good. So this time we ripped it all down because nobody wants to deal with all the discontinuities. And we replaced it all with new drywall, which the drywallers actually kind of loved and that was including on the ceiling. This reminded me of my own application, WIMBY. This is a RubyMotion application. WIMBY stands for Wells in My Backyard. It has all of the abandoned oil and gas wells in Canada in it. And why does this app exist? It's because it's entirely possible for someone to have an abandoned oil and gas well in their backyard. Anyway, so this app has been around four years. It was my first iOS app and it just works. I really like it because it just works. But last year I got this email from Apple about how my app was suddenly in violation of the App Store guidelines. Yeah, the new guidelines that they just introduced that said, you have to update your app every three years or we're gonna rip it out of the store. Yeah, so that's fun. Um, it, that also happened to occur right when I was having some vision problems, a macular hole, and I couldn't actually read my computer screen. And so a month later, I got the notice that my app had been removed from the App Store, which was fairly crushing. But recently, I finally, you know, put together some time to go back, and I was like, hey, I'm gonna get Wimby back in the App Store. But no, no I wasn't gonna get Wimby back in the App Store because it turns out when I was going to do a rebuild and I was going to upgrade some of my gems, my gem called Teacup, which was actually 90% of my user interface, is no longer supported and in fact highly not recommended to use. So I have to rip out the entire UI of Wimby and replace it. I actually didn't have time to do that before the conference because I got COVID. I did intend to do it. Okay, so we're moving into the end game here. So let's cover some please know in your renovation project. Please know asbestos. You really don't want to have asbestos. It's really scary. And whew, we got our asbestos test and we came up negative. So that was a huge relief. But when you have old things, you gotta check for stuff like this. Also like aluminum wiring. Now aluminum wiring was installed between like 1965 and 1972. So why was it used for only such a short period of time? Well, that was about when the um, insurance industry came up with the statistics that you, your house was 55 times more likely to catch fire if you had aluminum wiring. So 
We dodged that one too. Um, there was a major renovation done on our house. We found this building permit behind the drywall um, that says 1971, but apparently they didn't do any electrical work, so yay. But old Rails apps, if any of you are dealing with old Rails apps, there's a lot of scary stuff behind the covers because say, let's go back and look at eTriever again. When was it created? Rails 0.13 was when we started. And back at that point, we did roll your own authentication, roll your own authorization, roll your own job cues. Let's just take like one tiny slice out of this and see like what, what, what could be a problem. How about passwords? I mean, some people with early Rails apps had passwords that were saved in the clear in their databases. Ah. And then they fixed them with passwords saved with reversible encryption. Still also a bad idea. There are still Rails apps out there like this. And if you doubt me, there's also Rails apps out there not too long ago that still have passwords showing up in log files because all your Rails actions are logged with their parameters. So really, just because the app is old and works doesn't mean there isn't scary shit underneath the covers. Okay, I'm running over time, so let's get to the finish. And I'm sure you're going, Lori, now you're gonna show us the pictures of the completed renovation. <laughs> no, I'm not. So nothing ever goes according to plan. Um, our renovation was scheduled to be completed on October 28th, a month ago. This is what it looked like on Sunday before we left to come here. This is my living room. Yeah, I mean, lots of it is done, but there's lots of it yet to go. And as long as your app is in production, it's never finished. So don't think you don't have to do some upgrading. Okay, now I'm really finished. So if anybody is interested in mobile app development or game development in Ruby, come and check out the Windex School. I have free stuff for uh, Ruby Motion and for Dragon Ruby there. And of course, you know, paid stuff if you'd like to support my work. Thanks. <laughs>